Now we have a layer of coal, or plant material that was compressed to coal. So when we think about using coal, the first thing we have to do is get it, right? Of course. So there's a few different ways that we do this, and we'll go ahead and talk through uh, a few of these here. Um, coal mining really can be categorized in one of two ways. Uh, so some resources we would consider underground mining in my diagram here. I've got, a, let's say we have a miner right here, and he's interested in getting this coal, or his company is interested in getting this coal. Well, it's not at the surface, so we're going to have to go after it. And so in that case, we dig a shaft and go down and recover our coal. So it gets obviously a little bit more complicated than this. If we were to go in and take this entire seam of coal and remove it, I think that you can, uh, that you can clearly see if we take all of that material, we've got collapse on our hands. So in the, in the old school world of, of coal mining, you know, British coal mining, they would send people down, you would be able to do you know, a, a mine like this. If you look at my diagram here, you can start to see it doesn't look uh, it's very stable. But if you're digging a mine or, or you know, tunneling in by hand, the tunnel itself is actually fairly narrow, and the material that you extract is coal. And so it's kind of like uh, an ant colony. Lots of different tunnels and things like that leading out through um, through this coal layer. And the coal layer then has a lot of material left behind that will provide stability. Also, they would, in the old school days, they'd bring in timbers and things like that. So there's some sense <clears throat> that you need to provide vertical structure. And even, even the old school miners, uh, you know, 150, 200 years ago, they knew that, right? You can't just take everything or you're gonna get collapse. But we use coal if we're going to have a coal mine, we're not going to send some people down there in the modern world in, in this sense. We're going to go in and we're going to do this industrially. So although the, the general model of underground mining hasn't really changed that much, the scale of it has. So now I'm going to change, the only thing I'm going to change in my drawing is the size of our little guy. So in the modern world, we would... It, it would do this in a very similar way. We would go down and we would, ex we would take um, machines underground and those machines, there's a, a particular type of machine known as a continuous miner, which basically has a, um, it's kind of like a steamroller if you were to imagine that in your head, but the roller has a bunch of um, claws on it and it's off of the ground. And so that machine is kind of grinding away the face of the rock, and it's and then there's rock that's being produced that lands on a conveyor belt, that's brought to the back, and then taken out of the mine. So we do this much more efficiently now. Um, although again, the fundamentals aren't that different. So you can see this is a diagram that shows how a modern coal mine would work, where you've got our continuous miner, and again to prevent collapse, we basically have rooms and pillars. So you can see there's coal pillars, these kind of square bits of material that are left behind that help support the overburden so that you don't get collapse. If you remember, shoot, this was maybe five or six years ago now, but there was a coal mine tragedy, well it actually turned out to not be a tragedy, a coal mine issue in, in Chile or South America somewhere, and there are a bunch of miners trapped for months and months, two months I think, something ridiculous, but they were trapped in this type of mine. So they actually had electricity. They were just, it would be like being trapped in a giant warehouse, right? So there would, they, you know, some would go on jogs or runs, you know, around, around the place. So they weren't trapped kind of huddled in a, in a mine tunnel like they would have been in the olden days. So this really is kind of the modern application of what we would call an underground mine. Now that's just one type. So if I go back to my diagram and kind of change some scale. The other type of coal extraction is surface extraction, or what we call surface mining. If the coal seam that we're interested in isn't all that deep, this is a, a 
a time where we may ex we may use an extraction technique known as surface mining. And what you're going to find is that it's actually really similar to the techniques used to extract tar sands. Essentially, you just go down there and take it. And remember, in that case, we had this material here that we called overburden. So we want to get rid of that overburden, and we just want to take our coal seam. I've simplified this with just drawing one big coal seam, but in reality, you may actually have a few. So the face of your mine actually might be, you know, 100 feet tall with two or three different coal seams. And um, again, if you remember from the tar sand situation, this is pretty intensive from an ecological standpoint. So uh, let's uh, see how this works out. I have two different things going on here. So if we look at this side of our strip mine or our surface mine, what we've done is removed a portion of the overburden and exposed our coal at the surface. And you know, we would have our heavy machinery down here, right? Like our dump trucks and our loaders and things. In this case, we get to have some fun. Well, depends on your definition of fun. One of the things that's common to use is actually dynamite. So we would blast this rock, going through drilling down, inserting a bunch of explosives into this rock. When we blow it up, it's all fractured and then we can scoop that material out. So here we've got a bunch of holes drilled and there's an explosive charge sitting in each of those and some lucky person is up on a hill in the distance somewhere with one of those old school plungers. No, it's, it's a button on a remote controller now. Uh, but you clear the area, make sure everyone's safe, and boom, you blow everything up. And that's kind of the point. So once this is all fractured, we now basically just have a pile of rubble that needs to be removed to load that into some dump trucks and take it off for further crushing and processing, right? So that would be one way that we would have a run a strip mine. Another way to run a strip mine is actually with a pretty crazy instrument or a pretty crazy machine called a bucket excavator. So using a bucket excavator, this is my <laughs> cartoon drawing of a bucket excavator here, but I want to highlight some, some features, then we'll look at some pictures of a real one. These are actually some of the biggest machines that exist on Earth. So this is a small one that I drew here. Essentially what happens is it has a giant wheel with a series of buckets on it. So here you can see this is what one of them looks like in the real world. So it's like a scoop, um, similar to a water wheel in a way. And so when they fire this thing up, these scoops start turning and it literally just starts digging out the earth. And that earth is contained in those buckets or that ore or coal, <clears throat> coal in this case actually lands on a conveyor belt and part of the machine, part of the uh, function of a bucket excavator is that conveyor belt moves that ore, that coal, off in some cases really far. They move a lot of material using conveyor belts, dumps it, it and again, I'm just kind of drawing a cartoon here, dumps it in a truck and that truck takes that material off for processing. So these bucket excavators are pretty impressive. I'll actually give you guys a link to a uh, of the biggest one which is operating in Germany and it can if you if anyone is out in the audience has ever run a stump grinder you kind of wave it back and forth that's essentially how a bucket excavator works so it'll go into one face of the mine and extract that material that coal and then sweep along the face of the mine and then move in a little bit further and sweep back and so it's slowly inching forward they're actually mobile, they're not able to move very fast, um, but it does slowly march forward. These things are some of the most efficient machines on Earth in terms of energy used per amount of uh, material excavated. So this is the type of mining that we see dominantly in uh, Gillette, Wyoming. So the majority of the coal producing in the United States actually happens in Wyoming. It's fairly flat if you've ever been to Wyoming. So you could imagine that these two examples, the dynamite example here, or what I call the, the pickup truck commercial example, it seems like every pickup truck commercial is in a coal mine, blowing stuff up, dumping rocks in the back of the truck, or a bucket excavator in this sense. Obviously, if you were a small operation, you're not gonna be able to put out the multiple, multiple, multiple millions of dollars you're gonna need for a bucket excavator. 
but you can probably go to the local bar and find a guy who likes to blow stuff up, right? That's, it's much cheaper to do it that way, um, but it's not as safe and it's not as efficient as um, a company, a large mining company has the capital to buy one of these machines. And again, as machines go, they're, they're pretty incredible, pretty impressive. So I drew Wyoming, right? At least that's what I am thinking of when I'm looking at this diagram. That's not the only place that we do this type of mining. Um, historically, when I, when I talk about coal mining, you're probably putting your mind over in Appalachia, right? So still, I think about 20% of our coal comes out of West Virginia. But in that case, it's very hilly and it's mined in a much different way and actually a fairly controversial way. Here we are in beautiful Appalachia, West Virginia. I mentioned that is where a, a big portion of our coal comes from nationally. Again, most of it comes from Wyoming. But this place is fairly mountainous, right? It's not flat like the flat plains that we see um, out near Gillette, Wyoming in the previous example. Here we have coal layers, but they are kind of exposed as a function of topography. And so back in the day in the, um, was it Loretta Lynn was the coal miner's daughter? Some great classic country song like that. In those days, in the olden days, we would do exactly like we had highlighted before. Maybe some miners would go in here and take some of this coal out by hand, or you know, we might start to run an underground operation. But the world has changed. So what we've now realized so first of all, it's unsafe underground for a lot of reasons, and it's expensive. And so if you're a, a mining company, your financial goal is profitability, right? So cash rules everything around us, right? Um, this becomes where we start to see things get pretty dicey from an ecological standpoint. So in the modern era, and we've been doing this for <clears throat> my guess off the top of my head would be about 15 to 20 years is a recovery process called MTR where MTR stands for mountaintop removal eek right so here in the previous example we had the overburden OVB in my example and just like in Wyoming we had to get rid of that material in Wyoming we went and dumped it somewhere else to save it here, we actually take that material and because there's nowhere to put it on top of our mountain, we actually just push it into the adjoining drainages, which as you can imagine is a pretty bad deal. So let's say we want to uh, mine this coal seam. So we've, re we've removed our overburden. Generally in this type of environment is a, the good old dynamite method, right? So we're blowing this stuff up, um, pulling it out with our diggers here, and loading it in a dump truck, and they drive it off, you know, again, somewhere else for processing. Um, but the result after this is all finished, so you can see at least, you know, they're not even done yet in this mine, and they haven't started mining over here. So when this mountaintop removal excavation, type of excavation is finished, the result is actually a flat surface where previously there was a mountain and a drainage, right? So not only are the peaks gone, but also the valleys are gone as well. So you can see this is an incredibly destructive and um, <clears throat> kind of hair raising type of coal extraction. And, and, and again, it is where a big portion of our coal comes from. So if we look at some of the results of mountaintop removal projects, you know, it, they can be kind of jaw dropping, right? So you can see here in this first image, they're kind of in the background, those are the active faces of the mines. Um, there's one notable example. So again, a lot of this stuff really gets tied up in litigation. Um, <clears throat> you know, people like to sue. There was a family who owned some property and they had a family cemetery in an area that a mining company wanted to take the coal. And so they sued the mining company and all, and all of those sorts of things. And they actually got protection from, for their family cemetery, which was up in the hills. And um, rather than being up in the hills anymore, now it is the hill. And so you can see that image here, this little cluster of trees and a road you can see that comes down. 
that's the preserved family cemetery, and they essentially took all of the land around that. And again, we've been doing this for a while. I'm gonna give you guys another um, another link to the West Virginia mountaintop removal um, kind of window in the Google Earth engine. You guys had seen that before. And you can see that it's not isolated at all. There are lots of kind of scattered places in Appalachia where this happens. I think there have been you know, close to a thousand individual operations like this, some bigger than others, right? So a fairly environmentally um, taxing type of extraction. The last thing I wanted to talk about, at least in the context of extraction or recovery, is just to look at this diagram. So this is um, a really nice diagram. You can see on the left-hand side, it has some cartoons showing underground mining methods. We didn't split out all of these different ones. But we did talk about the coal, the, like the pillar and room style of underground mining, and so you can see sort of kind of various depths of pillar and, and room style. And then you can see over on the right, surface mining. This diagram in particular is kind of putting a focus on uh, the mountaintop removal or the MTR. But remember that most of the coal that we extract in the U.S. comes from Wyoming, places that are, that are fairly flat lying. And actually, I'm also going to give you a, a, a link to a Google Earth engine image of the area surrounding Gillette, Wyoming, so you can see those coal mining operations progressing, which happen in a much more uh, in a much more linear way. Right there's kind of the face of the mine that's always marching backward, rather than in Appalachia where they have some topography to wrestle with, which is a little more chaotic. Um, but in either case. You know, it's, it's really easy to get mad about it, right? And, and I get it, right? This, I, th I think that environmentally, this is incredibly destructive, um, but that's what's keeping the lights on na for now, right? And so when we think about moving to different types of energy in the future, this is really what we're getting away from, even though, um, a lot of the coal that we produce in the United States, we don't actually burn, right? We produce a lot of coal that we then put on a barge and sell to another country. So even if internally we were to be 100% reliant on other forms of energy, which generally this time is kind of a pipe dream, we're still gonna be mining this stuff and sending it overseas as long as there's an economic benefit. Excuse me, as long as there's an economic benefit. So. All right, well, I'll see you in the next video, and we'll talk about how we take this magic rock that burns and turn it into electricity.